Hello everyone, reporting today for Fun Robotics Network, I'm Bob Haas, and with me here today is none other than Team 21229, Quality Control from Washington. Year after year, they're one of the most innovative robots of the season, and Decode is no exception. This year, they've come with a left-right automatic sorting robot with a rubber band intake, very fast shooter with automatic limelight uh, alignment, and a bunch of very creative features. I can't wait to jump into these, take a deep dive on how exactly they implemented everything, and more coming up on Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Take on the decode season with Studica Robotics, featuring their FTC starter bot, new six millimeter hex shaft and motor options and updated bevel gears. FTC teams can receive a 25% discount and apply for grants at studica.com slash robots. For over 100 years, Kettering University has offered a better education because from day one, that education has been built on hands-on co-op learning. Kettering's impressive alumni network includes founders, presidents, CEOs, and front runners who have a reputation for transforming industries with their resolute leadership. Apply today at kettering.edu slash first. All right, quality control. So first question for you guys, you know, you have a lot of experience building multiple robots a season. And so you've gone through a lot of different designs. Why go with this left, right sorting mechanism instead of the spindexer that I'm sure you considered? Yeah, so in the beginning of the season, we wanted to be as flexible as possible. So we wanted to create a robot that could do both sorted and taking and shooting and also non sorting and taking and shooting. That's why we designed our intake to be able to sort left and right, but also have the flexibility to transfer all the balls to one side of the robot for really fast uh, rapid fire intaking and shooting. Awesome, let's jump right into that intake. So if you guys can just give us a clear front shot of it and see how it intakes some artifacts and then we'll talk through exactly what you have going on there. So that would be fantastic. Okay. Yeah, so um, our intake consists of some rubber band rollers that can really effectively get the ball in as they're really squishy and compressible. So here's uh, a video of this. Yeah, yeah, very cool. So, so a bunch of questions there. I see that your rubber your rubber bands are kind of expanding and uh, you know kind of ballooning outwards. Uh, was that intended behavior, or how did you guys deal with that and work with that? Um, yeah, we it was kind of sort of intentional and unintentional. Um, so we wanted to have rubber bands to be really flexible and be able to intake the ball really easily without it, um, without pushing the ball away. And when we noted, and when we spun the intake at really high speeds, the rubber bands would just open out a little bit, and it just helps us get a little bit more reach and grasp with our intake. Sure. Now, now talking about those two different wheels, I see you guys are running both gecko wheels and those blue wheels on that front intake bar. Why use the different types? Yes, so uh, we noticed that sometimes the rubber bands were not uh, were not enough to get the balls to intake. Uh, so on the sides of our intake, where we have the triangular guides, we put some different wheels on it to allow the intake to have a wider error margin and intake uh, balls that might be on the side. Was there any reason you chose two different types of, uh, you know, intaking wheels or uh, like why, why not just have them both be boot wheels or both be gecko wheels? Yeah, so um, a pretty, a pretty uh, big problem we wanted to solve was to intake balls that might be side by side. So that's why we tried our best to use uh, two asymmetrical wheels and uh, so one ball might enter first before the other ball and prevent like two of them from getting stuck in intaking at the same time. Could, could you guys uh, turn on the intake uh, right now and see and show us like how that asymmetrical uh, funneling works? That'd be great. Awesome. Yeah. So, so it looks like those boot wheels are going to uh, pass the artifacts through first, followed by the geckos. That's that's really fantastic. Uh, last question about that front bar. What RPM are you running it at? And is it sprung or just gravity weight down? Um, so our intake motor is a 1,150 RPM motor and we have um, a chain down here. We actually have two chains, so this intake motor has a chain that aligns that connects down to the central shaft. And on the side, we have another chain that connects down to our rubber band. So once our ball intakes, um, 
there's another set of noodles here and another central beer wheel here that gets it fully inside the trees. Got it. And as far as um uh you know as far as like springing, I see I see you guys have it at least uh like hinged, but is it weighed down by gravity or just like you do have springs there to pull that intake bar down? Um so we actually have a servo that uh turns that powers the intake uh roll of front roller by the linkage so it can uh, rotate up and down. And also this linkage allows our intake to be really flexible. Um, so when a ball comes in, it can bend up a little bit to allow it to stay in one piece. Mm -hmm. and, and why have that uh, like active positioning for that bar? Why not just have it like sprung or, or completely rigid? Um, so a uh, big concern with our intake was that it might be really easily hit by other robots and break. Mm -hmm. So we have it such that when we're intaking, we can extend it outward to get the balls more easily. While uh, when we're not intaking it, we can just set it to a lower position where it's uh, it's really it's protected inside the robot and it can withstand fully the season. Awesome, that makes a ton of sense. Now, going through that artifact path uh, to the next step, it looks like this is where you're going to have your sorting occur. Walk me through what your sorting mechanism actually is from a hardware side, and then I have a bunch of questions on the software end. Okay. So, in the inside of our intake, we have this central sorting wheel that uh, is powered by a continuous go build a super speed servo, and it can spin left or right based on the detected color of the ball. Um, and once it spins, the other noodles on the intake help uh, send it to the two transfers of our wheel. Awesome, yeah, that, that's super clever. I haven't seen them many, many other teams with a mechanism like that. Uh, I see you guys also have some smaller like sushi rollers or 16 millimeter diameter rollers going on there. Are those actively powered or are those just passive uh, to help with friction or what do they do? Yeah, so they're actively powered. Um, we use a round belt and we uh, flip it over to make the figure eight shape. Um, it's kind of over here. Okay. You can see it makes like a figure eight shape um, and it kind of acts like a bottom roller in typical it takes where and it just helps the ball transfer into the channel a lot more easily. Was that something you guys uh, started like with a solid ramp and then added that and saw the improvement or have you had that the entire time? Uh, we just uh, first implement, we just implemented the bottom roller the entire time and it okay. was pretty well. So Got it, got it. Now let's let's go through the left and right paths for the artifact. Are they identical or are there some differences between them? Um, so basically once we have sorted the balls into different channels, uh, it's just a straight path from there. So our green ball using the transfer noodles that are servo power also just continuous servos, they go to the back of the robot and they're um, we have latches that can open and close that allows the ball on whichever side we want to get transferred into the shooter. I see. I see. And now now talking about transfer speeds, you know, with something with this many steps, I feel like transfer speeds would be something I'm concerned about. How uh, how fast are you guys able to do like your rapid fire sequence? Uh, and, you know, what was like the biggest improvement you made to get it to be that fast? So our rapid fire shooting right now, it takes around 0.7 seconds. But the thing is for near side shooting, 0.7 and far side is slightly slower because of the distance. Um, and the main thing that we did to improve this was improving our compression and also uh, just tuning the speeds of our guns. Got it. Now talking about compression, uh, walk me through first how much compression you have and what fly will you use it for your shooter? Well, so the compression of our shooter is 6 mm right now. In the flywheel here, uh, we're using 96 mm diameter uh, stealth wheels with like any hard weights on the inside. Awesome. And so uh, up around what RPM do you guys run your shooter at uh, in, in near side launching and far side launching? So for near side shooting, we run the uh, shooter velocity at around like 1,100 ticks per second. 
And then for far side shooting, we run it at around 1,300 ticks per second. I see. Okay. And so um, with, with these speeds, how did the how did adding those flywheel weights help? Like, did they what, what did that allow you uh, to do? Well, so adding the weights on the flywheel uh, preserves like the momentum in the wheel, and this improves this greatly improves like the recovery time. It allows like really fast. Yeah, that, that, that makes a ton of sense. Talking now about alignment uh, and the limelight. How are you guys using the limelight? Is it both IntelliOp and Autonomous? So currently we use limelight for IntelliOp only and it's to help our drivers so that especially when we're shooting from the far side, they can align. And the way that it works is that, so our limelight is at the front and the center of our robot. Um, and then the drivers just press one button and then our limelight detects the able tag and it checks the yaw error from the camera to the able tag and then we rotate our entire robot to the mic. Got it. And so with that alignment, is it uh, is it PID based or, uh, you know, is it like a kind of continuous alignment where you're constantly checking that yaw error or how are you doing that in Telio? So one problem we discovered was that our limelight draws a ton of power. And so in order to prevent it from drawing too much power during the match, we actually don't use the limelight uh, when we're not trying to shoot. We only detect it one time um, when we're trying to shoot, so like when the driver presses the button during teleop, and then after that we turn our limelight off. Okay, very interesting, very interesting. The the other question I have is about your guys' hood. So I see you guys have an articulating uh, hood, but rather than, uh, you know, kind of revolving around that shooter pivot point, it just tilts back and forth. So why go for this design? Um, so our lid can control, adjustable lid can control how high the uh, artifact can shoot. And uh, this allows us to shoot from like different places, including far zone and use. I see you guys have a patch of uh, some like rubber or something on on that lid. Uh, you know, did you have you had that from the beginning of the season? And what is it? Yeah, so um, we just have a piece of foam on this adjustable lid to increase the grip and the friction the wheel has, um, and make sure that like the adjustable lid can contact the ball for longer and control the ball's trajectory better. Mm -hmm. well, one, one more question about the shooter and going back to the compression. So it seems like you guys tested different compression amounts. What did you find the differences were between that 6mm compression and anything more or less that you tried? Yeah, so um, actually uh, for most of the season, we used 10 millimeters of compression for the shooter. And that meant like um, our retention time was really large. And that also prevented us from doing far side rapid fire shooting as the wheel couldn't be fast enough to shoot once it got to the third ball. So uh, we changed it back to, we changed it to six millimeters of compression. And, and because of that, our shooter can retain its velocity much better. And we, all, and we also could implement far side rapid fire shooting. I see. Did you guys try anything lower than six millimeter or was six millimeter just like the threshold and it was good enough so you stopped? Yeah, we didn't try anything lower than six millimeters. Uh, once we got it there, we were really happy with our result, and we just kept it that way. Mm -hmm. When you're develop, when you're uh, you know choosing the shot speed uh, for those far and near launch zones, how is your shooter automatically determining those? Yeah, so we have three different preset speeds that we can shoot. So the lowest speed is for near side shooting. The highest speed is for far side shooting, and then we have a medium in between speed for the far uh, for near side shooting, but when we're on the opposite side of the near zone. So okay. these three speeds give us enough flexibility to shoot like basically wherever we want from the field. Do you need to interpolate between those, or, or is just selecting the one your robot is closest to at any time good enough? Yeah. We're selecting the one that our robot is closest to. Okay, yeah, last question for you guys. I see a very interesting, like, extra camera kind of at the top of your robot. What's going on up there? So this camera is specifically for detecting the obelisk for auto. And we put it here and we have, like, another camera because um, we have this on, like, a rotating thing so that during auto, instead of having to move, like, the entire robot to see the obelisk, we can just rotate our camera and then detect it from there. 
Got it. Yeah, quality control, thank you guys so much. You know, year after year, super, super innovative robots. I mean, you've won Innovate or Designed at Worlds every year, I think, for the past two years. So this one's no exception. I'm really excited to see how this automatic left to right sorting uh, proceeds throughout, uh, you know, for the rest of the season and how you guys do at the Washington State Championship. So thank you so much for this interview. My name is Abhas, reporting from Fun Robotics Network, and this is Team 21229 Quality Control. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. For over 100 years, Kettering University has offered a better education because from day one, that education has been built on hands-on co-op learning. Kettering's impressive alumni network includes founders, presidents, CEOs, and frontrunners who have a reputation for transforming industries with their resolute leadership. Apply today at kettering.edu slash first. Take on the decode season with Studica Robotics, featuring their FTC starter bot, new 6mm hex shaft and motor options, and updated bevel gears. FTC teams can receive a 25% discount and apply for grants at studica.com robots.